Yep. Hello, welcome to Royal Path Network. Um, I'm your host, Andrew Funk. We have Cyprian with us and Father Turbo as well. If you want to give a little shout out real quick. Um, so uh, we're here today to kind of talk about, uh, we had talked a little bit before the show started about um, Cyprian's newly baptized um, two or three months ago, I think, or something like that, into the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, Father Turbo uh, was the one who baptized him. Father Turbo is also my spiritual father as well. Um, so during Cyprian's catechism, I guess Father had specifically broke down a couple parts of some really essential parts of the Orthodox Church. And um, when we were kind of talking about what we think we wanted to get into tonight, we had thought about kind of going through that again, the, some of the concepts that Cyprian talked about with Father. Um, so basically that's kind of what we're gonna do. I'm here to host and um, Cyprian's here to kind of comment and Father Turbo is here to kind of explain things as best as possible. So uh, I'm gonna open it up to you guys and we can just take it from there. Well, Father, I was hoping that we could start this uh, conversation, I think as, as it's moving forward, as we had talked about, by maybe using some of the framework of your very excellent catechism, where you brought me into the faith, and using as the framework the, the creed, which was something that I was shocked Actually, I, sh I shouldn't have been shocked by it, but I was shocked by the fact that I was, of all the things I was required to memorize, both uh, as an Episcopal and then as a sort of an evangelical, the, the Nicene Creed, the creed was not one of them, the profession of faith, but it's so important to the Orthodox. And of course, it begins with, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. And I thought that, that in this day and age, is a, is a very provocative statement. And since you are our father, spiritual father, and you are father to many in your role as a priest, and you are a father as we are fathers of, of children, of actual children, I thought that maybe starting out with a discussion of fatherhood would be helpful. And maybe we could start, and I, I, I don't think I've ever asked you this, uh, but maybe it's a good starting place. People ask me all the time, what is the spiritual father thing? Christians mm -hmm. ask me all the time. Cause I say, Oh, my spiritual father said, they're like, what's a spiritual father Catholics even. Mm -hmm. So maybe, could you talk a little bit about what, where, the, where this comes from? What's the role? The more that I've been learning, the more interesting it is, but it seems like something that is sorely needed, but left out of so many spiritual traditions. Yeah, um, well, it comes from, I mean, our history. Um, early in the scriptures, you see Paul, uh, St. Paul, the apostle, speaking about Timothy and the various churches that he planted. And he's commenting about, you know, um, being their father in the faith, you know. And um, this understanding of father, it, the problem is, is that it's so foreign to us because of what's happened to us. Um, and, and I think that, you know, even for, like you said, some Catholics, you know, there's terms that have been uh, kind of brought into the modern lexicon, like spiritual director, um, sponsor, you know, things that have a more, um, almost like a transactional aspect to them. Um, things that have more of a almost um, uh, a kind of management aspect to them. And, and I think that that, I think that's indicative of something else. I think that the, um, I mean, and the real meat of it is when we're going to get into, you know, what, what patriarchy is and what it isn't perhaps, but uh, I think the, the best way to understand um, a spiritual father is to really understand um, how fatherhood is intended to, to, to be, uh, to function. And I think the, the biggest thing for us in, in our tradition is that 
we understand that life as we experience it, as human beings experience it, you know, um, all, all the categories in which, you know, you can exist are all little aspects, little pieces of the mosaic um, that, com that comprise reality and that they all, it all reveals one little aspect of God to us. Um, it's interesting because, you know, the, the biggest thing about spiritual fatherhood is that um, right now in these days, there's such a real struggle against it um, in, in, in the West, in America uh, in particular. A lot of that comes from, you know, there's, there's these kind of mythological abuses that happen. And, and the reason why I say that is because we hear about these things. They say like, oh, there's like this elder abuse and things like that in Russia. Uh, like let's say in the you know, 18th century, 19th century. Um, and I, I'm sure that's there, I'm sure it's documented, but the reality of it is, is that um, this uh, fear of a cult-like control, this fear of a um, abusive kind of dominance, it's a fear that although real, I think the, um, the specter of, of that fear has more kind of activity than the reality, you know? So, so in other words, I'm trying to say there's things that exist, there's moments that have exist, existed where someone has, you know, lost their mind, right? And, and they, they've been inappropriate. But I, I think that's where a lot of the kind of adversion to this term spiritual father comes from. But the other piece of it too is just, if you look at the world right now in fatherhood, it's, um, it's sorely lacking. Um, it's being undermined in every aspect of society. Um, and I, I think that it, be, it can become easy to just blame men for this, this phenomena, um, for men being scared and not wanting to take responsibility and things like that, which is, that's what the core of fatherhood is. You know, fatherhood is, is to be um, responsible for, for others, to be responsible um, for, for their care, for their protection, um, for their guidance, for, the, for their ability to thrive, um, for their connection and their relation to the rest of the world. I mean, that's, that's what a father does. You know, a mother, she nurtures, she, she teaches, she, she guides, in, in, but in a very different way than a father. A father is really, um, in many ways, the, the kind of gate to the world for, for a, a child. You know, a child will learn how to function as a, as a human being, as an adult, uh, primarily through the good or bad example of their father. Um, and so getting back to a spiritual father, that's the difference I would say between a spiritual father and let's say, quote unquote, a, a spiritual director. Sure, the terms could be interchangeable and they are, I guess, but I would say the, the distinction is you know, a spiritual director sounds a lot like a manager, you know, someone you can fire. It's like, well, yeah, yeah. the yeah. outcomes aren't really what I like. And um, I think we could get someone in here to do, you know, get some better output and blah, blah, blah. I think it suggests more intimacy as a spiritual father rather than a spiritual director. Yeah, yeah, I, I would. I think that's I think that's accurate, you know. Um, now, on the other side of it, too, I, I could see where. Um, there, there could be a situation where someone likes the idea of being called a spiritual father and they want, you know, they want all the bells and whistles, but they don't want to put the time, in, you know, it's, um, and for them, it's like, they almost want to be like the spiritual grandparent, you know, they want to like play with the kid. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. They want people to say, oh, look at your cute grandkid. But when it comes down to the hard work, they don't want to do it. Um, and, and I can see that being a problem too, because the thing about being a spiritual father is the thing about being a father is that it's painful, right? Uh, a, a father is the one, a father does the hard work for the sake of the child, like full stop, full stop. Like, um, being, having fun and, and being the nice daddy and, and being fun daddy and all that stuff. That's great, but that's not fatherhood. Fatherhood comes in the hard decisions. Fatherhood comes the hard calls. Um, fatherhood 
comes with the hard work of being self-reflective. The fatherhood comes with the hard work of knowing yourself. You know, you can't, you can't guide someone if you don't have a certain measure of, of knowing yourself. You can't really share with someone how the world is going to, you know, kind of tear them apart potentially, you know? You can't share with someone how the world could potentially be their, or their oyster. I mean, the negative, the positive, the good, the bad, like it's very hard to share that with someone authentically um, if you haven't done the work yourself. And I think that's one of the reasons, again, why maybe people are uncomfortable with the term spiritual father these days is because, yeah, you may find a lot of people who haven't done the work and they can sense that. Um, and so I don't think it's something that is, um, you know, getting back to this, this example of St. Paul, but St. Paul earned that, <laughs> that title when, when he said it. I mean, he, he poured his life out. When you read in 2 Corinthians, he just talks, you know, He's kind of giving them a little bit of sarcasm um, about like everything he went through for them, even though they they seem to treat him like dirt. You know, that's that's fatherhood. You know, a father expects his children at some point in time to kind of hate him. Um, and and he's prepared for that because his love for them is so much greater than their love could ever be for him. And and for me, that's that's the essence, at least this part, in, this far in my journey as, you know, a spiritual father, a biological father, um, and someone who had a father. Um, that, that's that core for me. And that's how um, I have begun to really uh, understand, you know, my calling as a father. And that's the way I try to encourage um, my, own, my own children, both spiritual and biological, my sons, um, that's, that's the key, you know, that, that uncomfortable space of, um, understanding the, the hard work and, you know, you do what you do absolutely 100% for the love of, of your, your children, expecting, you know, nothing in, in return. That's what our Heavenly Father does for us. We give him nothing except, we give the Heavenly Father nothing except for headache and heartache. And he gives us everything from the air that we breathe to a really good ice cream cone. I mean, you know, it's the, the there's no comparison to, to the love that the father gives us. And so, yeah, you know, like Jesus says, you know, us being wicked fathers, you know, we wouldn't even give our, we wouldn't give our, our sons, you know, our children uh, a serpent for a fish. How much more so will our heavenly father give us what is good. And so um, to me, it's like, that's the bar, you know, that's the bar I give my kids, the good things. Um, so I don't know that really answers the question we're just kind of discussing it, but I think for me, that's like the heart of it is being a father is all about um, doing the hard things and not wanting any, any, any return, wanting no reciprocation. And that's so antithetical to our culture right now. Mm. Um, cause, Cause again, everything is about that exchange. Which is why that that term like spiritual director, I mean, I don't know, it, it kind of bothers me because it's um, it's it gives you the sense that you're in a relationship that can be easily terminated depending on how somebody feels about you know the other, and you can't do that with with a child, you know. Um, Father, mm -hmm. there was uh, there were these two specific instances that were profound for me that really keyed me into getting like you know sometimes something will happen and you'll get this deep sense but it's not a deep sense about a, a truth or a, a deep understanding but it's it's deeply implicit as opposed to like this very articulated thing and there were so there were two two times i don't know which church father i was reading but just almost as a throwaway line there was a, a, although of course it's not a throwaway line, but uh, but <laughs> almost almost as an aside, right? It's not, obviously not a throwaway line because it hit me in, in the gut. But it was like that you just that you don't you never say no to your spiritual father, and that the idea is that he's not he's never going to give you something 
that would be something for you to say no to, because as you say that, like, he's taken on that responsibility, like that, that this was the first thing. And I don't know whether this was a, a, a more ancient father. I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure who it was where I heard that, but it was, in, or read that, but it was interesting that after reading that, you know, we had this Russian priest who came here and there was some question that he was asking me regarding, you know, him being willing to do some, uh, some pre-sanctified uh, gifts and some other things. And, he was just like, look, I'd be willing to do this, but it was interesting him, me just having mentioned, you know, my spiritual father and this, and told the story of you coming here. And then when he came here, but he was emphatic. He was like, but listen, you have to talk to your spiritual father about this. Mm -hmm. Like I absolutely cannot do this. Mm -hmm. Now here's a priest doesn't know you from Adam, mm -hmm. right? Is like you're Serbian Orthodox. He's Russian Orthodox. He answers directly to the patriarch in Moscow. And he's, but he's here telling me, look, I'd be willing to do this, but I absolutely cannot do this unless you speak to your spiritual father and get his permission on this. I cannot do this without that. And it was in that moment where I was like, whoa, this, it really just that this idea of holy patriarchy, mm -hmm. right? Of like, I am, I like, here's where I am, wherever I am as a cleric. I cannot, I don't know who your spiritual father is. He could be anybody, but I simply cannot go over his head mm -hmm. on something that I am completely qualified to do. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be very, very interesting. And, and I, I had, you know, I mean, I, I obviously I consulted with you about it at that time, but like to talk, just for me to, to maybe better understand the place of the spiritual father, even in relationship to like the holy holy orders because it seems like there's almost an, an other a whole other dimension to it there mm -hmm. and it was just profound to me when that incident happened you know yeah um so saint Silouan, uh the athenite he says that um he's talking about in the context of you know kind of confession in, in that relationship he says you know <clears throat> excuse me essentially the the first word from uh, the spiritual father is, is as from God. Um, now, his, his disciple, uh, Saint Sophroni, he gives some very good, he gives some incredible insight into that and kind of begins chewing, you know, breaking that down a little bit because he says like, yes, although this is true, uh, and he's speaking as someone who was a spiritual father uh, to many uh many monastics on, on Manathos when he was there. He's like, basically, yes, but the second someone begins to argue, the second they begin to say, well, this is that, he says, that grace is gone. Because now what was, what was a kind of entrance or a, a kind of connection, a pure connection, if you will, um, spiritually speaking, it's now muddled with all the psychological stuff. Um, and, and that's important to understand because I think some of the, the a lot of the concerns when people talk about spiritual fatherhood, um, there's, they aren't without merit um, because there are people who, number one, um, we are in a time where there's, you know, holy elders running around, especially in America, all over the place, you know, um, and, you know, there's that thought that if you find someone who says they're a holy elder, run from them, <laughs> you know, and I think that, I think that's a, I think that's a wise thing to do. Yeah. Um, but this, this understanding of the hierarchy that's um, echoed, um, the heavenly hierarchy that's echoed through that relationship with with the father, um, and I, and right now I'm going to say even like the biological father and the spiritual father because again, um, there's more that connects them than separates them. If that makes sense, you know, a biological father, if he's firing on all his cylinders, he very much functions like a spiritual father to his biological children, you know, and a spiritual father, if he's firing on all his cylinders, he functions very similarly to a biological father to his spiritual children, right? Um, because the, there's some givens there, you know? 
um, love. <laughs> there's, there's, there's the assumption that the father has love for his children that supersedes his ego. And so, so the problem is, and this is where everyone gets worried about fatherhood and spiritual fatherhood, and even some people will be like, who are you to talk about spiritual fatherhood? Is that um, the person who doesn't understand the absolute necessity of the calling of the love of a child. So in other words, um, you know, I can be a narcissist and all those things with my children, but that should be number one, the exception, not the rule. Uh, and number two, <clears throat> if I have a father in my life uh, and, I'm, and I'm doing the work of being a son, then hopefully those things that would keep me from being a good father have been dealt with by the time I'm in that, in that, I'm in that position, right? That's why, you know, it, why do we say, hey, you know, 13 year old kid, even though biologically you can sire a child, you shouldn't. Why do we say that, right? Because the 13 year old child doesn't have obviously the livelihood, he doesn't have the means to care for a child. But what I was getting back to earlier, he doesn't have the skill, the experience, the context to be reflective, to really understand himself and to really offer something to that child that he would sire. He, he, that's the real reason, you know, if, if I can prove it to you because, you know, back in the day, people had kids at 15 years old, like, like and, and legitimately, right? Not that long ago, right? Um, you know, turn on Naked Night and watch an episode of, you know, Little House of the Prairie, right? I mean, that wasn't that long ago that, that people were having children at that age. So, so I, it gets back to this thing of responsibility and responsibility is only possible if you have some measure of experience and, and being, and being self-reflective. So I, I say that again, because that's, that's a context that, you know, a priest understands a spirit, another spiritual father understand and say, look, <clears throat> if you have a spiritual father and you're at this place where you're calling someone a spiritual father, then there's some things that are a given, right? And those things that are given, um, they are presuppositions of responsibility, both on the, mostly on the behalf of the priest, the spiritual father, but also on your end too, that you're old enough spiritually to at least have some sort of understanding of, of what you're saying there. Um, now, of course, we can find exceptions. People find exceptions all day long, people playing guru and all that stuff. But again, the thing that really cuts so much of that noise out is love and responsibility. Those two things, you know, a, a guru uh, is a, a guru is to a father, a spiritual father, what a baby, what a baby's daddy is to, to a father, right? The guru is the baby's daddy, right? He can he can sire the kid, maybe he can maybe drop some some groovy morsels of you know you know, kind of clandestine wisdom. But even then, who's that for? That's probably more for the guru than it is for like the person that are learning from. The guru's like, check this out. Exactly. Like exactly. life, like are we the real alien? And it's right. like, it right. like, there's no <laughs> right. sustenance to that. Right, right. And 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 see, and that's that's like another piece of it too, because um you get people who they want to play around with all these things too. They want to play around with like externals of orthodoxy and this and this and that, but you know, you'll find that um, someone who's, if you look at the fruit, if you, if you see a priest, right. And he has, you know, not just parishioners, but he has actual spiritual children, meaning people that he, he is relationship loves and guides that are outside of his, you know, quote unquote, direct parish, and you see the fruit, right? What is what is the fruit? Are these do these people tend to be wackos? Do they tend to be lacking responsibility and love for other people, or or are they lacking any sense of like repentance, right? Then yeah, this person's probably just kind of caught up in themselves, and they're just 
you know, they're an ego pretending to, to be whatever. But when you start looking at, you know, the fruit then you can start saying like, okay, maybe there's, maybe there's some, there's some depth there. And so that's why the, that whole self-reflective piece is important. That's why being able to understand um, the holy terror that's involved in, in caring for someone's soul. Mm. It, it, it's, I mean, I shudder <laughs> even talking about, it, you know, it's, Right. But but the other thing, too, that, that I wanted to touch on, they said, Cyprian, which is, you know, kind of important to understand as well, is that um, there's a, a real kind of top heavy administrative in the same way you would maybe find the kind of administrative structure in a clinic. Right. It has value but it's not necessarily appropriate in the setting of a family or of a, 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 a father and his children, right? Because again, there's, there's a whole mercenary aspect to it that seems to me to be like a running thread that's kind of inferred in some of these things. Um, and so this is important because um, uh, the father that you were speaking about, the reason why he was so particular is he understands that God is working differently with everybody, right? There is a kind of base level of understanding, a base level, which same thing in the, in, the, in the natural sense, right? You know, the base level of understanding is a father provides for his kids, blah, 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 right? So there's, there's these base level understanding, same thing as spiritual father. But the big difference is, is understanding that, you know, God meets us where we're at in an incredibly profoundly personal way. And the spiritual father is, you know, that kind of vessel of, of God the Father leading and guiding that, that sheep, if you will. And so because of that, another priest is going, a good priest is going to be incredibly sensitive to that and sensitive to the reality that um he's not aware of, of what God has been doing directly in your life. And the assumption that you have a spiritual father, then that means he's been attentive to you. He knows where you're at. Um, and he's going to be asking God for mercy on how to guide you. And so because of that, he's not going to want to cross the streams, you know? And, um, so I, I think that understanding is really important because one of the things that's kind of like dangerous um, is that there, it's just like anything else, you know, you are to some degree um, subject to um, the very reality of, of another man's, another person's, you know, faults, their foibles, um, their ego, whatever that is. But the thing is, is as Orthodox, we learn to trust God even in that. Yeah. Right, that yeah. yeah, God uses, God can and will use, even a kind of crummy priest, or if you had a crummy biological father, it's like it's not as if God disappears because you know that that father figure has that icon of the father has been damaged, which that gets us into like a whole other thing in in regards of I mean. The for me, it just it's a very obvious concerted attack on fatherhood that's been happening um, in in Western culture for sure for the last few decades. And yeah, I, I was gonna I was gonna ask about that. When did the when did patriarchy become like a bad word? Like when did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't really know exactly when it started happening. I mean. I would I would guesstimate probably just as good as you guys would. I mean, it felt as if definitely within the last like seven to eight years. Oh, story, that soon. I was gonna go uh, back further, but yeah, yeah, I would say I would say the last seven, eight, seven to eight years, there's a there's a definite shift. I mean, you could probably trace it back to early you know, women's, some people will go like, well, let's go back to women's suffrage, right? Like That's that, kind of that, where my mind went. I was like, right? immediately, like right there. I was like, that's where I would probably place it. But I'm but guessing. See, but even, even the first wave feminists, though, I don't think that they were anti 
the patriarchy as a whole, it seemed like they were anti like that they that 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 because you you like a Camille Paglia or somebody like that. She's like, no, it's not the problem's not the patriarchy. The problem is like the negative aspect of the patriarchy, just like there can be a negative aspect of the matriarchy, the matriarchy. which we're yeah. seeing like big time, right? <laughs> sure. So so it's like, but I so <laughs> I agree with father that it's like within the last decade was when it was like smash the patriarchy. That was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. And it's like, well, smash smash fatherhood is what you're saying basically when you do that and it's like what what could be worse <laughs> i can't imagine like i can't imagine don't smash fatherhood and don't smash motherhood either one like this i couldn't imagine a worse worldview than what we should be going around doing is smashing the very idea of a, of a father that seems terrible to me well i mean for me it's it's one of those things where um I, I think the really getting back to this idea of, um, you know, the father being revealed uh, in, in, in relation to the family structure, right? And there's, there's all these people who want to say, well, the nuclear family, blah, blah, blah. Okay, never mind all that. We're just talking about it's kind of stripped down reality right now, you know? And the, re, the, the thing that we miss is that the fall inverts everything, right? And so the problem is, is that when you don't have an understanding that things are not functioning, <clears throat> excuse me, as they were necessarily intended to function, then you begin to not know what to do with all the very legitimate um, grievances that exist, right? And, and this is this gets into the thing about, um, kind of left and right temptations, right? Because for a lot of people on the right, they're tempted in thinking that, you know, the, the absurdity of wokeness and everything makes me just want to go hardline and, and act like everything has been perfect. Well, the fact of the matter is, is everything has been perfect. And that there's a reason why, um, what is everything's been perfect? Sorry, I, I didn't understand. Everything's been perfect. You mean like it's been good and then wokeness is ruining it? Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, like, the, like, what are you messing with? Everything was functioning fine the way it was. And, and you know, no, there's, there's you're, been, you're saying this is what people on the right are saying. This is what people is, on the right are saying. Okay. okay or this, is, this is the sentiment that's there. Okay, got right? it. So it's this overcorrection. Right. So like, I'm, I'm going to say all, like these things that just make us like cringe. Right. It's like me too. Right. Okay. Well, guess what? <laughs> Before the crazy witch hunt and all the, just the absurdity that's happened right with me too. The fact of the matter is, is like, you know, I wouldn't want my daughters subjected to the, the, the really disgusting, depraved, um abuses that a lot of women in certain industries especially have had to endure harvey like, weinstein really did those things harvey he weinstein, really did the he really he, did those things that's <laughs> not the issue that's not what we're taking umbrage with that's whack we're not right. in fact that's not good right right but the problem is is that people when when you cannot go down that royal path <laughs> you you cannot under you you have to keep in order to do that you have to keep both sides like that's why it's so difficult and a lot of people, they just want to throw the baby out of the bathwater and act like now these, you know, these disgusting pigs never existed. And that's just all someone's just kind of like witch hunt, blah, blah, blah. And that, that's just not the case. The reason why I'm saying that is because then you be, when you understand that, we understand that the image of a father being a shepherd, being a husband, um, and being a father, like, those, those three things, right? That, that's kind of the essence of, of what fatherhood is. We understand that those things have been tainted and damaged. The next question is like, well, then how do you repair it? And that's where you, that's where you come to Christ. You start to see like, oh, what Christ does is he, he, he reverts back that image. He shows us who the father is, right? He shows us what it means to now you know, patriarchy that 
that kind of distorted, twisted icon of it is like dominance and, you know, um, being, you know, kind of paternalism in the negative sense, condescending, even getting to the extremes of like being abusive, all those things. Christ is, is, is meek. Christ is wise. Christ is firm. Christ supports. Christ corrects. Um, Christ shows us who the Father is. You know, he says, like, you see me, you see the Father. So what that tells us is that this healing, this setting a right, this is the path. And when we see that path being established, then we start to say, okay, now I at least know what I'm looking at or I'm looking for, I can start seeing what, what the bar is. And I think this is important because one of the problems that I, I find with fatherhood where I start messing up is when I forget that there's a template. If I start trying to kind of make it up on my own, if I start trying to, you know, you know, we're always building the plane where we're flying, so to speak. But I think the thing is, is that when I remember that the father has been shown to me, through Christ, and that as I begin to follow, not just simply after him in a kind of like moral way of him being the teacher, but when I partake in his life, what then happens is I'm now able to give life to my, to my children. And that gets, you know, that practically looks like that kind of self-reflection I keep talking about. But, you know, that, that self-reflection, I'm not talking about, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm not talking about kind of like doing my daily journal. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm talking about living life with, with your eyes open, living life honestly, and living life with courage. Like those are the things that a man needs to do in order to be a father. And I mean, there's something that, that's kind of gone unspoken here, but let's just be clear, as absurd as this is going to sound, you have to be a man to be a father, you know? And you have to understand what it means to be a man. What it, what it means to that generative principle of bringing forth life, right? Like the woman nurtures the life, but the life comes forth from the man. It's, it's the generative principle. And that's where we, can, we start getting into these theological truths, right? Of, of, of what it means to be, you know, male, but more importantly, what it means to be a father. And that mirror, that icon that's revealed to us, that's the key. When you begin to really study the Father as he's been revealed to us through, through Christ, then you begin to really understand not just where we've gone wrong and how those real issues of abuse and dominance and, and all that stuff have tainted the image of patriarchy. More importantly, you find a way to correct it and you find a way to build something that is life giving because that's the key about being the father being the father is about giving life and that's why someone's either a spiritual father or they're not in the sense of do they do they impart life by are they participating in their priesthood that god has given them in such a way that their quote-unquote spiritual children are receiving life to me that's that's the litmus right because you can get someone and you can think there's a good spiritual father, but you, you look closely, it might be more appropriate to say, oh, he's a really good teacher. Yeah. Right? yeah. He, he's a really good teacher. Or, you know, um, I'm going to even go here. That this, this might seem a bit too much of like a splitting of hairs, but I'm going to go here for a reason. He could be a really good coach. But being a coach and being a father aren't the same thing either right? Um, a father can be a great coach, right? There's overlap there, but a coach isn't a father in the way that it's, it doesn't, it doesn't flip the same way, right? Fatherhood, again, a lot of it has to do with this kind of mercenary aspect to it, right? A coach is paid, a coach does what he does. Yeah, for the, the, the participant, but really, the coach is in it for the love of the game, right? Exactly. A coach well, is fa like, father. I've had I've had coaches who were, I would say, like my best coach ever, who was also my my partner who uh, trained me in beach volleyball to play. Like 
to be able to play at a very high level. We were out off the court or outside of training. We were equals Mm -hmm. buddies, like became one of my best friends. You know what I mean? Very different, not a father son relationship at all. Like an absolute bro, you know, on the court, he's the authority because he's got the decades and decades of experience and, and the receipts to prove it. You know what I mean? Off, off the court, or even like if we're, you know, when we're playing and he's not playing the coach role and he's my partner, we're equals. Mm-hmm. But that's totally different than a, totally different than a father. It's, it's totally different. I'll tell you a story. I, I remember maybe about a year before my dad died, I was cutting his hair. And, um, you know, I, I was really repenting of some, um, it could have been worse. You know, I, I could have been, I was, <laughs> I was really bad, but I wasn't, I wasn't bad in regards of uh, my angst and a lot of blame wasn't directed at my parents. You know what I mean? And, and they knew that, right? I was just, I was just something else, but um, I was really doing some repenting and I was just really trying to just, just be present with my dad, you know? And um, so I'd go there and hang out and stuff. And uh, I remember cutting his hair one day. I was talking, whatever. And I can't remember what I asked him. I, I basically asked him about like if he's if he's bothered by like not having any friends really. Cause like at this point in time, most of his friends had died, or he had kind of been estranged from some of his friends because of some of his past and this and that, you know. And uh man, it gets me now even just thinking about it. And you know, he just says, he goes, he's all no, I got you, man. You're my friend, you know. And the, the thing about that was, was, I mean, I, I, even now that's just one of those kind of like heartfelt moments for me. And, and it, it meant everything for him to say that to me, but we weren't buddies. <laughs> I mean, don't, you know what I mean? Like, like if, if anything, when my dad said that to me, my, my level of respect and love just went up like a couple mega notches. Right. And I, and I, and I think, I probably even became more deferential to my father at that point because my father in his weakness, right? And this is very important because my father had been laid low. My father had been someone who had the world by the cojones, let's say. He just, you know, he had money. He had, you know, for for his, for his time and his, you know, kind of, peace of the world, he had power and influence, he had all this stuff, right? Um, and he just lost it, boom, just like a Job situation, just get peeled from him, taken away. My mom became sick, became blind, crippled, became homeless, was sleeping in a car, like all this stuff happened to my dad, had all that stuff taken away from him. And so my dad was left in this place where he, he was being forced by God to make choices. And I'm going somewhere with this because this, this is where I really learned how to be a father. I remember asking my dad, I was upset that we were um, losing our home. My first home I grew up in, big, you know, big home in Orange County. Whatever. I just remember my dad, one well, because I, I know it so well now. <laughs> I don't mean a dad, but I'm like, I'm like, I'm like complaining. We're having to move stuff, all this stuff. And um, I remember my dad just stopping as well as moments where inside he probably just wanted to like pick me up and choke slam me like <laughs> through the van door you know but he just stops and he just says he just looks at me and says you still got a mother don't you right mm-hmm. he said that because i was upset why we're losing our house but what i didn't really understand was that my dad had to put everything up the house the businesses to pay for the medical bills for my mom right and i also didn't understand that the doctors had told my dad at one point just to let my mom die because if she lives, she'll be a vegetable. And if she's not a vegetable, she's going to be blind anyways. Like her quality of life isn't, so just let her die. And so that's one of my first examples of what it means to be a man, to be a father, because he was like, no, my kids need their mom. Right. No matter, he understood understood what that meant beyond just the kind of like, material aspect of her functioning, you know, like a maid or, or whatever, however people think of that, right? He, he, he moved past his own 
let's say, kind of like material, materialist trappings and something moved in him, right? So that, so that was like the first thing, you know, these things brought my dad to this place where, you know, you fast forward 10, 12, you know, 13 years later, I'm cutting his hair. I now have my first kid who's, you know, just a couple months old. He's getting really close to dying. And my dad now, because of the suffering he went through, he's able to talk to me with no filter. He doesn't, he doesn't need to kind of filter it for me to either understand it. He doesn't need for me to kind of like have it be um, candy coated because of, he doesn't need that. He's, he knows he needs to just speak to me from the heart. That's another thing about being a father is that you don't have to go through the rehearsing. The, the love and the awareness of who you are and who that child is, that's your filter. If you understand what I'm saying, it's that that's your filter. And so my dad understood, like, like he didn't read the scriptures and said, oh, Jesus is meek. So I'm going to do this to talk with you. You understand? His suffering brought him to that place already. He was already experiencing it. So when he says to me, like, you're, you're my friend, right? That wasn't some sort of like, hey, let's be buddies. Like so many of these sick people are. And I, and you know, forgive me for that sounds, but you do your children such a huge disservice. That's, that's ego. Yeah. When that person says, Hey, I want to be your buddy. No, 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 no. You're that's your ego. That's you. Those are the people that, that twist up their kids, right? Because you, you are, your children are there just for you to fulfill whatever psychological wounds, quote unquote, you have. When the reality is, is like, when you have a kid, it, it's all about that kid, meaning, again, like I said 15 minutes earlier, right? I expect them to sometimes go, I hate you, dad. You're so mean, blah, blah, blah. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And that means I'm doing my job. I, I'm doing my job correctly. And that means if I stay on that path, I can get to that point where just like my dad, I'm able to say like, hey, you know, I can, I can, I can meet you in this, in this space of me being weak. And, and me being able to just be open to you and with you because now like you're ready, right? You're ready. And, and that, what are you ready for? You're ready for me to, to show you. You're ready for me to, to, to not just kind of tell you those hard words, to tell you those things, but to show you what it means to, to limp through this life, right? And, and that is another aspect I think of fatherhood, but also spiritual fatherhood, right? Is that a spiritual father, this is just me, just, just from my perspective, but one of the things that's absolutely essential to be a spiritual father is you have to have, to some degree, gone through hell and, and come back, right? And, and I don't just mean like, oh, you know, I've had substance abuse problems or I went to jail. I mean, you've gone to that place where you're like, Am I going to abandon God? Am I going to reject God? Am I going to, someone was mean to me, you know, I'm going to leave the church or um, whatever, whatever the various things that, that the devil tempts us with. A spiritual father has to have actually been to that place of, of Peter and being in that place where like, are you, are you going to deny me, right? I think that's another key thing because a spiritual father fundamentally has to has to see his his role his calling as ultimately pointing back to the father and saying like he will never leave you nor forsake you right everything that's happening in, in your life right now is because he loves you right you have to be able you if you <laughs> someone is sick and dying, their kid's dying, their wife is dying. And this happens. And this is, I think this is one of the wisdom of the church why typically speaking, according to the canons of priests, is supposed to be uh, under 30 years old or whatever. Typically. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because, because there's a measure of life experience that you kind of like, look, um, it can happen and the grace of God flows through the ordination. That, that's, that's, that's true. 
But like that guy's got to be pretty extraordinary in regards to getting out of the way in order for him to go to a 50 year old man and console him about the death of his kid or his wife or the loss of his ankle. Like you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And not actually gone through it. Like yeah. not actually gone through a measure of real suffering. That's kind of what I'm getting at. It is, there's, there's a measure of suffering. It doesn't have to be that exact same situation, but a spiritual father in order for him to be that has to have gone through some things where he's like, I, he's, where he's been tempted like Joseph, right? When you look at the nativity icon, Joseph, the betrothed, right? That's an icon of a father right there. He's sitting there bewildered. And the devil's whispering in his ear. Yeah. All the doubts, right? If you haven't been in that place of Joseph the betrothed, you're kind of probably not really at a place to be a quote unquote spiritual father, right? Um, well, Father, that also, and maybe this is why it's spiritual director in some other faiths, but it's like, it seems like to be it's the, a, a father, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, axiomatic thing about a father, if you're the son of a father, is that it's like, well, the father has actually been a father of a son, like you, <laughs> you know, sure. what I mean? yeah. it's like, watch, watch the son grow up in all of this. And it's like, and presumably that has also meant maybe not so much in, in modern times, but for all of history, that it's probably also meant a relationship with a woman who was your mother or some other woman who was his wife or whatever it was. And it seems to me that to, to legitimately say, oh, I'm, I'm going to take on this role of spiritual father, but to be like, I've never been married. I've never had children. You know, I've never, it's like, I could see, yeah, the age thing I could see like, okay, 30, but it's like, it would be very hard for me, I think personally to feel and maybe not, you know, the Lord is going to work how the Lord is going to work. And maybe that's not the case, but it's like, it, it's, it seems to me looking at it on the face of it, that, that my openness to getting advice about my marriage, getting guidance about my children, all of these things is going to be much more difficult if I'm speaking to someone who, who is not speaking from experience. Right. Never, never mind the spiritual aspect, but who's not, who has no experience with that. It's going to be very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. I would just say that. Yeah. And if I could just jump in here real quick, I'm just going to jump in real quick. I, I can tell you in the field that I work in, there is this whole debate, which is recovery. I work in a recovery, like a treatment center. And there's this whole debate right now about, and I, I don't know how long it's been going on. I'm sure Father can talk a little bit about when this started, but I jumped into the field about the time when people um, are really debating heavily about if you can truly counsel an addict or an alcoholic if you haven't been there. So there's this whole idea of peer support, of being able to talk to someone. And it could, it could, you know, it's like a, like a, it's like a coach. And I use that term literally as father described it earlier. You know, there, it's a coach. I have one specific role. I want them. I, I want to encourage them in this one way. There's overlap between other things, of course, but there's this one goal I have. So counseling somebody, you know, I'm a coach because I've been there. I'm in recovery, you know, but like working with somebody when you've never had that experience, it's, I tend to take the perspective, it's possible. It's possible to do that. And working in the field, I've heard of a lot of people who do do it very, very well. And they're like, look, man, at the end of the day, a doctor doesn't have to have cancer in order to treat your cancer. And I'm like, yes, that's a legitimate argument. But the point that I'm making and the joke I always make to people, and I don't, I mean, this is just my dark my dark days, but it's like you tell someone who's never lived it. If you go into a meeting and you tell someone, look, I know what it's like to show up to jury duty drunk. And if people laugh, they're like, yeah, totally, man, I get it. You know, I get it. I've been there. Then it's like, okay, I'm among peers. But if there's a couple other reactions you can really have to that, that can kind of get me to say like, you don't quite get it. 
Like maybe that's what I need. Maybe I need someone who doesn't quite get it. But I tend to find it be a little bit more comforting when someone does get it, when someone can't, and again, not impossible. I'm not saying it can't be done, but I'm saying that like this actual lived experience is valuable. And that's what they tell you over and over and over again, is your most powerful tool is your story. And it's like, okay, awesome. And like, I tell people all the time, when they relapse, relapse is part of my story. It's okay. Like it's part of my story as well. And instantly people deflate, like instantly people be like, okay, all right. Because I've been there. Like, you know, it's that whole empathy versus sympathy. Like I've been in this hole. I can help get you out. Like I know the way out versus sympathy being like, that really sucks. Do you want to talk about it? Like, as they're like looking down into the hole, like I can try and help guide you out, but I, I don't know. Like, I think that that's one of the, and I'm almost done, I promise. But I think that that's probably one of the things that I do tussle with. I tussle with because it's politically correct to now say, and there's a bunch of that stuff in my field that's politically correct to say there is no difference. And, you know, there, there is, some can be just as valuable. Mental health crises and drug abuse is the same thing. And there is no difference. Is a, there is no difference. Is a pernicious um, phrase that's that said a whole lot on a whole lot wow. of things as of late, isn't it? There is no difference. That huh. that's a isn't that a pernicious? If you hear that, it's like the color blue, man. I'm going to be hearing mm -hmm. it all the time now. There I've is no it. difference, man. All the it seems like all the evil is in that's that's where all the evil is. All the spiritual evil is in the phrase, there is no difference. Wow. I'm going to start hearing that like all the time now. Every time I'm listening to the news or anything, like I'm going to start seeing that all the time now because that's been pointed out to me. That's yeah, great. You know, it's funny to me too, because I think there's a, there's a couple of things there. Like touching on that real quick is, you know, this, this understanding of like hierarchy and, um, you know, like John the Bacho does a great job of just kind of like harping on that like a lot. But it's, it's very true in regards of if people don't at least begin to approach that reality of hierarchy, then it's like impossible to understand reality. Because what's, what's, being, what's being presented to us right now is not reality. Let, sure. Let's just, let's be frank and let's just be honest. Clearly, clearly it's, it's not reality. Not reality <laughs> you know I mean? um, but I want that digress real quick and I want to address something. You know, St. John Chrysostom, he talks about how um, some people would critique the idea of like a monastic giving um, advice to, to married folk. And it, it's great. He, he talks a lot about it, but I, I don't think those, I don't think what he's defending negates what we're talking about. And, and this is why I say this because Oh, okay. I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Like, like as a father, to daughters, right? I don't know what it means to be a woman, right? Like I, I don't, um, and I don't want to be. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to know because I'm a man. You know, and and I'm a and I'm I'm a father, right? But what I can do is I can meet my daughters in such a way that completes their experience too, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's a there's a, a gap of understanding that we all have, right? Um, my wife doesn't know what it means to be uh, a son. And my sons need that gap so that they can connect with their mother because humanity is male and female. Mm -hmm. And that male and female gap is breached in the sibling relationship, in the paternal relationship, and in, and in the, the, the relationship between two married folks. It, that, it's gapped. It's, it's woven together, it's complementary. We need to have those two things met together. You know, We need to have that, that aspect of communion. So it's not necessarily about having this kind of like 
one-to-one -one experience, right? And I know that's not what we're saying, but I just, I can imagine people being like, well, St. John Chrysostom says in Marriage and Family Book. Do not quote St. John Chrysostom. Like, that's, right. that's, that's, that's my guy. guy. That's my guy. That's for St. John, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but do you get what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I just, I want to bring that up. I think it's important because it's actually in, and this kind of gets us back to it's all the same. It's actually in me embracing and leaning into those distinctions, I think is where those hidden aspects of my fatherhood and my manhood are revealed to me. Because don't mistake my, you know, my confidence or, what, or whatever for me, don't assume that I think that I, I kind of, I'm still exploring what it means to be a man. I'm still exploring what it means to be a father. I'm still having, a, you know, I, I had a whole situation before we started talking, you know, tonight, the three of us, you know, with just sitting with my family, you know, um, in the most mundane thing, you know, my wife just made this incredible meal. We're sitting down, I'm having like a warm beverage, whatever. And all my children are like playing around me, except for my 20 year old, you know, and I had this kind of like moment um, where I, I began to see that my life as a father is not something that I can fully grasp. It's something that's still being revealed to me. And, and the reason why I think this is important is because one of the ways that I function best as a father, whether it's spiritual or the biological, is when I was when I stay in that place of not knowing, not being negligent, but knowing that there is a there's a gap there that needs to be filled by only God. God needs to open my mind, open my eyes, and allow me to see the periphery that I can't see. He needs to kind of expand my understanding of, of who I am, what I am. And I only can understand who I am and what I am in the light of the other, in the light of my children, in the light of talking with you guys. You know what I mean? That's, that's the other part of this that I think I want to make really clear for me is that it's not about reading a book, right? It's about that living experience, getting back to that reflection, right? That reflection isn't always this kind of like, Again, it's not the diary, it's not the set, of set aside time where every Friday morning, you know, I'm on the porch and thinking about being a dad. Like, you know what I mean? It, yeah. it happens instantaneously in the weirdest things. Like my kids, like watching like a Strokes video, you know what I mean? And just, yeah. and like, we're all just like the other kids are like dancing and like the dogs there. It's just like, in this most mundane moment, something ineffable happened. You know what I mean? I just, mm. it, was, it wasn't planned. That is not just as much a part of fatherhood as anything else, it's almost like the core of it for us. It's that discovery, right? That discovery of who I am, my calling, my responsibility, the embracing of it, the, the, the joy of it, all of those things in, the, in their totality. That's something that you can only experience. You know, it's that whole thing I kind of talked to you guys about, uh, learning to see without looking right it's 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 seeing something without looking at it super important because we don't have all the answers and when we begin to want to and that's one of the problems with that that kind of um it's all it, you know it's all the same that's that's that problem is that all of those those kind of answers what's pernicious about that is it's idolatrous it's so self-sufficient it doesn't leave any room for God. The thing about everything right now is everything that's happening spiritually is trying to leave no room for God, right? You know, the, the, the health crisis that started in, in, you know, 2020, leaving no room for God, right? The way that that health crisis has impacted the churches, leaving no room for God, right? The way people are just losing their ever-loving minds, like vampires scared of the sunlight. You know, there's no room for God. It's like anything we can do to avoid sickness and death, right? What is that about? There's no, there's no room for God in that, right? The, the destroying of the patriarchy, the, the, the devouring mother, mommy knows best, like all these things is all about trying to get something as airtight as possible, right? 
And one of the things that I learned from my dad is when we went through tragedy upon tragedy, my brother dying, being homeless, my mom being sick, him getting cancer, like just on and on and on and on and on. My dad had this way of being present, being confident, but not being deluded. I, I, I never, it was never a thing of like, my dad was able to do things in such a way that I left room for him to make mistakes. My dad was able to do things in such a way that, that it left room for me to be like, just to kind of watch him and to see, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It left yeah, him human. It left him human. Yeah. It left him human. And, and I think that's really important too, because, you know, in, this, in the spiritual father thing, and again, I, I think this is where some of that, some of those critiques and some of those concerns about the term come from is that, again, people want a guru versus a spiritual father. But in order to really know what is, to understand what that relationship should be like, you have to have some understanding of um, a fatherhood in your relationship to it, whether you're a woman or a man, right? And, and it's like I, I told you, some of you guys, I told you guys this before, but it's like, I, in many ways, have learned spiritual fatherhood from, you know, trying to be the spiritual father that I needed or wanted myself. Totally. Right? Totally. totally. So, like, you know, that that's the thing. And um, I'm not threatened at all. In fact, I'm always wanting to hear from you guys. I'm always wanting to hear from, like, and that was another thing that I saw from my dad. You know, like, getting back to this thing, there's something that's interesting. My dad didn't feel the need to be when I when I was in the hospital for like four months, you know, three months from like uh, heart problems, and asthma, all this stuff or whatever. Like my dad didn't feel the need to be a respiratory specialist. Hmm. You, know, you know what I mean? Sure. Like that he didn't he didn't feel that need. Right. He knew what he needed to do. Right. Um, and, and I think that some that's something we need to also kind of be aware of, too, is. But the call of fatherhood is not um, is is not about being, you know, this kind of impervious, perfect. That that gets you back into this weird function of like a job. It's not a job. It's 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 a relationship. It's a calling, you know. Um, and so because of that, that's why um, you know, trying to tie that loose in with Saint John Chrysostom. That's why you can have a monastic as a spiritual father, but if he understands all these things, he'll be wonderful. Um, because more than trying to, um, more than anything else, he's looking to, to the shared father of the heavenly father. And he's, he's echoing what the, the father is giving you, uh, what, what the father's giving him for you, right? Um, and that's, that's that essence, right? Um, as a dad, I never, like, the only way I'm successful is if I'm constantly looking to the father and being like, just this morning, you know, my kids go off to school and then an hour and a half later, I get a call, such and such kid needs to be talked to after school. I'm just like praying, Lord, give me the wisdom to reach to reach him. Give my wife the wisdom to, to reach him. Give, give the teachers the wisdom to reach him and to help us to know where to meet him at so we can build off of whatever incident happened. That was my honest prayer. Like that's, that's what a father does, is the father goes to the heavenly father and says, this is what's needed. You know, a, a father's an intercessor. You know, that's a father- That's priests are called fathers, right? That's right. That's right. Did I cut you off? Did I just- you know, oh, that's Okay, good. all right, my fault. Someone's gotta cut me off, man, I'll just keep- <laughs> but, Father, there, there's this this concept in here this leaving this leaving room for god um as we're talking about sort of everything that's happened right in the last two years <laughs> it's like it's such when you said that like it's such a profound concept to me and it's I, it's you know it's profound to me because of my experience I think specifically because of my experience as a father, you know, like there's, there's, 
young guys that I'm around now more than ever, like guys in their twenties with me in my forties, you know what I mean? Who are now reaching out to me. And I was just thinking about this the other day that it's like, Oh, Oh yeah. You're like an older man now. <laughs> you know, like so You need to start thinking about yourself that way. Right. So it's like, they reach out to me and you know, they'll, they'll say like, uh, much in the same way that I, I did at a certain point in my life. Yeah. I don't want to have kids. I just want to, you know, they're too expensive. And, I, and I'm like, first off, that's that, that there's a little, there's t- too much mythology around the yeah. too expensive thing. Right. Yeah. That's like, that's, I don't know who's, who, well, I know who's pushing that, but it's like, is. yeah, we know who's, we know who's pushing that, but so we'll just leave that to the side. But there is this idea that it's like, but what you, what you gain is in that space that you leave for God, because exactly as you say, like it's in the issues. It's when, you know, my daughters have gotten sick. It's when there's been things that have been needed where it's like, how is this going to, how is this going to take place? Like, how am I going to keep them safe? Like, and then the, the space it's only to reach out to God in that space. Cause it's like, I've got to, that, that's the intercession part that you're talking about. And it's like, without, it's almost like, you know, I say that my, my, my daughter and my wife saved my life because it's almost like without that gap, as you say, without the need for me to reach beyond, without the impetus that it's like, I must do this because of my love for them. I can't, like, I couldn't move forward. Like everything that I've gained has been because of that, that gap where the only thing to fill it is, is God. Like, it's so profound that you're saying that because really like when I play that out, I'm like, oh yeah. Then like the idea of, you know, like the, the, who's now the metropolitan in, in uh, Montenegro, when he got arrested, when he was a bishop, a uh, Serbian Orthodox for, for doing a procession. Mm-hmm. And they were like, no, this religious procession, you know, goes against the, the quarantine or the lockdown rules or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, but that's the, like, you're not going to leave any space for God to do something mm-hmm. like you're not going to leave this. Right. This could be transformative right. for our entire culture. You didn't understand. This is an opportunity for us to all be transformed in like a, the biggest way ever. You're not going to let God do that. Right. Right. Well, it, it's funny to me because I mean, kind of drilling down a little bit, forgive me is um, I, I just think a lot about <sighs> my son, my, my second oldest son, he's been on this kick lately. Um, he said something to me a few months ago where I was like, wow, you know, um, he's like, yeah, I just, you know, I just want to be a, a dad. Mm. Um, he's like, I want to have a family or whatever. I was like, whoa, you know, um, that really hit me hard because, um, from my perspective, you know, having eight kids, uh, and just someone can imagine the chaos of like eight kids and the difficulty of eight kids. It's like, I'm surprised any of my kids would want to have children, you know? Um, <laughs> but, you know, they had, to hear him say that, I was like, okay, you know? And the reason why I bring this up is because um, very much in the same way, Sabrina, I mean, I, I came to Christ in, in this place of just the, just the most abject darkness and filth, you know, but it really wasn't until I got married and began having a family that my relation to Christ became that process of, of, of Christ being incarnated in me, if that makes sense, right? Like, it wasn't until I began to come into my calling by proxy of being a male and becoming a man, right? And taking on the responsibility and the love of the other and caring, providing, protecting, like all those great things we talk like those things that we just kind of like intuitively understand about, about being a man and being a father, being a husband. I needed, I needed them for that to not just be abstract concept. I needed that, I needed them for it to not be machismo or something weird like that, right? Um, and You're that's- not a man. You're not a man until you've been thrown up on by a kid before seven yeah, o'clock you know, in the morning. 
I mean, I mean, one of the things that like, I think this is, everyone knows this is probably one of the key reasons why Jordan, Jordan Peterson was so successful a couple of years ago. It's like the same story over again. There's all these disenfranchised, angry, um, desperate men who just, you know, didn't, didn't have anyone who was really articulating their plight. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and he, he was able to articulate their plight, you know, and, you know, it's the whole make your bed and all that good stuff. I, I did all that. But the, the thing is, and, and this is what I hope most of those men, and I'm speaking about them in a kind of like in an abstract way, forgive me, or in generality, but in order for them to move past just another level, although a better level, but another level of, of theory and abstraction, right? Which is like, oh, it's okay, I am a man. To, okay, great. But like, what they may not realize is they need to actually, they may have just come to this realization I'm a male, but in order to be a man in the sense that we're talking about it now, there has to be that willingness to take on that responsibility and that burden. It can't just be theory. And the reason why I'm putting it that way is because I think that, um, I think that there's a lot of guys who um, maybe like the idea of having a wife and a family, but for whatever reason, still, they're not able to cross to cross that kind of bridge or gap that bridge that gap of, well, if I want to have a wife, one of the kids, there's, there's certain things I want, I got to let go, you know? And a lot of it's the basement dweller thing, right? But I don't even talk about there. What is that term? Oh, oh gosh, gotcha. yeah. I thought you said basement yeah. dweller. Now it's like, um, okay. A lot of that comes down to, I mean, and forgive me for being so explicit, but like, this is a real thing, you know? You got, you got a lot of guys who their relation to women in that context has, it, they have more experience in, in relation to women and their mind with porn than they do a real woman. Sure. 100%. That's a, that is a disease. That is an absolute pathological disease right it, now. It's, it, people don't understand how damaging that is. Um, and they don't, and you're very accurate for calling it a disease super because what's happened is you, you can now start finding some young women being affected with it and thinking that that's the way that they need to be. Um, and that level of infection is where you get a level of degeneracy that's begun to really infect the broader society. Let me be real explicit here. There's a level of degeneracy that was only relegated to certain kind of sex of people. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's just becoming, you know, standard, commonplace way, like default of relating. And, well, and, if, and if you speak negatively about it, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Like if you question it or critique it and be like, are we sure we, this is healthy? <laughs> what, what, what yeah. what's wrong with you? What kind of a, you know. You're a bigot. Right. And, it, and it's, it's, it's super hard because it's like, um, it's it's kind of maybe not the best analogy, but it's one I like a lot because it's, it's it's real, you know. Um, a lot of people have never had a salad. They've had tons of dressing. You know what I mean? Yeah. They've had nothing but dressing, but they never had a salad. Like people don't know what it's like to eat just like a red onion and some arugula and carrot just together, and just like having that delicate balance come together in such a way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because they're used to just like just like pour it on the dressing well it's the same thing in regards of relationship and and, and how that self-sacrificial i dare say canonic aspect of being a husband and a father um there's lots of guys who have sired children and they have a wife okay but maybe let me, me, me let me rephrase that they've sired children and they have, 
<laughs> like a concubine or something. You know what I mean? They don't, they don't have this, you know. Um, they check in. Yeah, like a wife is husband, okay, a husband, right? So husbandry, right? A garden, right? Like the husband then takes care of a garden. Your wife is your garden, right? And depending on, you know, are you a good husband? Do you tend to your do you tend to your garden? Do you do you weed? Do you water, <laughs> right? A man plants the seed in the in the garden, right? The husband, the man plants the seed in his wife, right? So like when you understand that and when you tend to that, that's what it means to be a husband. But a lot of guys, because of you know, the fallout from how how far our society has lost contact with those very real, intimate, but mundane aspects of life. Um, they don't understand, they don't, they don't, they don't realize that they're missing something very beautiful. They don't realize that they're missing something very beautiful in the mundaneness and the difficulty of being an actual husband and being a father right that's where that salad analogy comes into play because they need to have all the dressing you know it's just like well you know if you're a christian you're christian guys whatever well i want to get married so i can you know have uh, legal sex you know what i mean um i'll have like you know 2.5 kids whatever just because like that's what i'm supposed to do like it, it's all of those temptations are very real and men have to work, I think, extra hard right now. Um, spiritual directors <laughs> or spiritual fathers, godfathers, whatever, I think need to be really particular in, in this instance and not assume that the young men in your life know what it means to be a husband or a father now because porn has ruined them. Um, the lack of responsibility as a brother or as a son has ruined them you know basement dwellers aren't the best sons right i mean i'm not trying to fault anyone but you understand what i'm saying like those things have eroded the ability to really experience those very sweet and profound aspects of relationship of, of a husband and father because it takes um it takes a refined palate, one that's that's been weaned off of the kind of over the top sweets and, and all the chemical flavors that come in the dressing, right? Yeah. You gotta learn to wean yourself off of that. And then like, man, this is really good, right? Um, and, and a lot of guys, they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to wean themselves. And, and so therefore, when they do get married or they do maybe start having kids, it's like, it's, the there's still a lot of work that needs to be done for them because they are still addicted to the world in a lot of ways. They're still addicted to all of the kind of over the top instant gratification of pleasures that that is what, that's what the world tells you as a man that, that that's what it means to be a man. Get what you want, get it now, get it quick, get it however you want it. And, well, and, and father, there's also this, this weirdness I, 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 sorry for interrupting, but I didn't want to skip over it because you, because you, you hit on something that's like a vibe that I've been feeling is that, and, and perhaps, I mean, perhaps I, I myself, although I, I, I never thought I would get married until I met my wife. I never thought I would get married or have kids. So I'm a, maybe a little bit different, but there's this notion, this feeling, and you're like, you, you, you hit on it right there that it's like, I'm seeing this guy say, I want to get married. I want to have kids, but they're like, I want to find a woman who's right for me. But the me that they're talking about is like the me right now, who mm -hmm. they are like now. And it's like, bro, no, you're yeah. not, you're not what woman would want you. Right. Like you should, the, the, your whole thing should be like, no, I want to be if you're doing this right, because I know I who I am is totally different mm -hmm. since I've been married and had kids. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Like I'm a, a totally different person. And it's like, 
I, but I, I got married because I wanted to be that person, not because, and, and I knew that my wife could make me, she, even just when I first met her, she made me a better person. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, you're pulling me toward, I, I, how did I know she was pulling me towards Christ and pulling me towards the church, but certainly she was, right? right. So it's like, you're pulling me toward a better me. It's not like I'm, and, and, and that's what, like, Father, when it goes to oh, well, here I have this model in my mind that I've built off my porn addiction, right? This, this is some young guy's got that it's like, oh, this would be the perfect wife for me. And it's like, if it's the perfect wife for you now, you're in a lot of trouble because who yeah. you are right now is a very not good person. Right, right. And, and it, it, forgive me, it's one of those things too where um, I don't know... Like, I, I couldn't imagine trying to just find a woman just in a natural sense. Like, I, I just, I mean, I thank God for my wife. And, and the thing is, is my wife has a way of just bugging the hell out of me in a way that, like, like I've never been so bugged by so by someone else in the way that she can, right? That's God. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. like no one can get me as just stupid mad as my wife. That that's God. Because that's precisely where all the magic happens. Right. Um, and it's it's it is that get, kind of getting back to that thing. It's like that space, leaving space for God is so important because those things, those crosses, those burdens that I was really aware of in our you know second, third year marriage, 20 years down the line now, man, they were just, it's, it's uncanny, the accuracy. I mean, the accuracy is just, it couldn't be anything but God because, you know, I, I married my wife after, you know, my first initial kind of stage of really having God purified me of, of a lot of very vain things, right? Which has been, a, a, it's still an ongoing process, it's still ongoing. But those first initial stages, it's like a, you know, a sculpture. It's like, the artist, the sculptor would take, you know, these first, you know, five strikes of the, of the chisel and the hammer, these big chunks of stone are coming off. Boom, boom, big chunks. And that's how it was, these huge chunks of just like vanity and just all, just all this stuff is coming off. But it's only now looking back retroactively, you know, I'm just like, wow. Because it wasn't just so much about, like you were saying, the person I was then, but who I am now. Like the man that I met now, um, yes, obviously I, I'm the man I am now because of who she is and how God has used her as this chisel in my life. But what I'm talking about is it's crazy how just she's the right tool. And forgive me, it, I'm not trying to say like she exists solely to form me, right? Or solely to make me a better person. But you get what I'm saying? Like, She's so perfect in, in getting in those fine details now of being able to like, okay, this is the eye. This is the shape of the eye. This isn't just kind of like the general eye socket, but this is, the, this is what my eye looks like now. Because that's what theosis is, right? Theosis is me becoming fully turbo. Like that's, that's it, right? And so she is that vessel of that absolute sanctification, that being set apart, right? That being set apart so that I can be made, in, you know, more and more by grace into God's likeness and image. Like she's that tool and vice versa, obviously. So that's not something that, um, which is one of the big dangers. And I know there's some people who have had, I mean, we know someone uh, who's, uh, the three of us know someone, um, your godfather, Cyprian, who's, you know, one of these incredible stories about people matching well via the internet, you know, like a, a whatever, right? 
but I dare say more of an exception than the rule. I was yeah. going to say that's kind of why dating is so whack, right? Yep. Because I mean, yep. It, and, and and I would just say this too. The other piece about that is is you know it was quote unquote orthodox dating website, and the point being is like there's an awareness of not wanting God out of the picture is what I'm trying to get at. Sure. Like, so so I think this is this is a thing that for a lot of people is real tough too because um, inviting God into that situation of in order for me to be a husband, I have to have a wife, right? In order for me to be a husband, I have to be a man, right? Uh, in order for me to be a husband, I have to be a man, I have to have a wife, right? Uh, and in order to be a father, I have to have a wife. And, and like, that's the thing too, is getting into this, like being a father, not a baby daddy, right? Um, because that, that responsibility is one that is only realized in difficulty, hmm. right? That, and and that's, that's just like, it's the cross, right? You can only realize that in difficulty. The avoidance of that, that's where the whole baby daddy comes from, right? Like th that's that avoidance of that difficulty. Um, but you know, the, the struggle is not just real, but it's, it's what makes things real, actually. Like that's, we use that phrase weirdly because it's, it's the struggle is what makes things real. It's what makes them actual. It's the struggle is, I can have an idea about a painting, but it's only until there's paint, a brush touching the wall or the canvas that that painting is real. And that's what struggle does. It, it's, it takes effort and energy to make that happen. And, and I, I can't stress that enough because getting back to the whole kind of basement dweller thing, it's like, that's one of the big disservices. And I don't know, I, I, that's a big disservice in my mind of where the kind of helicopter parent, the smothering mother, the devouring mother, that, like that, that has been one of the reasons why the basement dweller has started to kind of like become this um, like meme in society, you know? I think because it's, it's an unwillingness to allow God in. And what I mean by that is the difficulty, right? The, the difficulty. I'm not talking about those people. I know there's a million, it's, well, listen, jerk, this is what happened to me, blah, blah, blah. That, that's fine. Generally speaking, though, it comes from the mommy who can't let her her baby boy. You know, it's Roger Waters stuff. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> if you listen yep. to yep, sure. you know, Pink Floyd, it's just like that's that's what he's talking about. You know, and it, it's not it's not that it's a new phenomena, obviously, but it's it's taken on a whole nother level of. Um, concern and maybe um the level of kind of like the pathetic nature of it has become to such a, a kind of like heightened degree precisely because there's such a real crisis in in what used to be something that we took for granted forever which is marriage right well, there's this so there's this thing father that is again like that keeps that keeps coming up with some of these young guys that I talk to who, who look, I think the, the, like the basement dweller is a constant, it's something like a constant threat. I think to every young man, like that he would in the same way that the father may be revealed to him, the basement dweller will be revealed to him if he doesn't like orient in the right direction. Right. That it's like, Next thing he knows, he sort of wakes up and he's like, oh, I'm a, 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 I'm a coomer or whatever. What are these little memes? You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's me. I'm a basement dweller now. Like, this, that's, that's the thing. But one of, what keeps coming up, and maybe this is, we're coming up on it. So maybe this is a good, a good like, jumping off point for, for us to end this. But it's, this thing keeps coming up in conversations that I have with, with men, young men, where... They, I, I see their, I see their, like, inching toward the basement because they, they say, well, what, what am I supposed to do? 
right? Like, what am I supposed to do? Even, and, and I think that like, there's some sons of Peterson now. And I think that these are the people that we're talking about who are like, well, let me check the boxes, like husband, uh, father, but it's to check a box so that they can keep themselves out of the basement. You know, they're like, I need to just, this is the best. And Jordan Peterson gave like, clean, clean your room. And it was like, well, at least there's something to do, you know, but what keeps coming up and coming up is like, how do I know, how do I know what I'm supposed to do, supposed to do? And I mean, you know, obviously I'm like, the only thing I could tell them is, is prayer. But I think that for some of them, for some of them, like, this is not, this is, this is not enough in terms of the registering but i feel like there's there's something here there's something about and i mean i just i i just want your thoughts on this because it's this idea of the father being revealed Mm -hmm. right and and the idea that who the father is is going to be revealed and the very revealing of the father itself is christ Right, that the, the the very revelation of the Christ is the revelation of the Father. Like so, when, while the Father is being revealed to you, that is, you're moving closer to being in Christ. So I'm just I, I'm I'm like wondering to like to bridge that gap, maybe a little bit, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I get it, you get it. How do I how do I bridge I mean, the gap for a materialist to start be moving in that direction? Yeah, I if mean, I may I mean, field this one, I'm just gonna go ahead and field this one really quick. Um, I, I just had something interesting to say in the sense that, like, I think, because I don't want to lose it, because I'm going to lose it if I don't say it. So uh, this idea of, like, checking boxes, right? So, like, you have your, your guys who are genuinely, they feel something inside them, that they need to be doing something, right? But you can check your boxes, you can read your Peterson, you can read your survivalist guidebook, whatever, you can try and figure out exactly the kind of father that you want to be and ultimately what's going to end up happening I think to some degree at least this is what happens with me as I get really in my head and I'm like I'm my rationality has come to the top like I'm no longer uh, a person with multiple natures I'm a person with one nature and that person is rationality so if I just think things out so I say this because going back to father turbo's father when he said no I got you you're my buddy Like, that wasn't a book. That wasn't like a checking of a list. That wasn't like, you know, he read in this certain book at a certain time, it's really good to kind of make this connection with your son. What that was is that was suffering. That was being humbled. That was a now like a like a heart being purified of like the ability to let that thing shine through this like this revelation of the father this revelation of what it means to be a real person what it means to like be able to say just the right thing at the right time you know like because i'm not always able to do that and a lot of times it's because i'm searching my databanks in my brain you know i'm like searching what the correct thing is to do and i choose option 747 or something like that and it's not the right thing to do because it comes across as not genuine it doesn't come across as real. There's no warmth behind it. You know, that's that's you going to whatever, like a robot for something. And you know, we're not robots. We're we're there's kind and warmth. And I I promise I'm gonna try and limit this as much as I can, but that's that's why Captain America works. Like that's why he works as a person, is because you have your whole idea. And I told father at the beginning of 2020. Was I was like, uh, I told him, I was like, there's a split, you know, so there's this civil war. And in the comic, the civil war, you have Tony Stark, who's trying to register all super, super, superheroes and Captain America, who's against it. And Tony is logically correct. Something horrible happened in the, in the comics. Some superheroes are messing around, a bunch of kids die. It was because they're being irresponsible with their power, right? Tony's logically correct. You, a plus B equals C, you know? But Captain America feels that it's not correct. He knows the, the heart of the matter, the spirituality of the matter. And when this whole thing first started in 2020, I was talking to Father and I was like, I feel really good because I feel like there's a civil war right now. 
you know, and like for the first time in my life, I'm on the side of Captain America. Like I'm backing Captain America because I feel it in my heart. I'm not trying to deduce what the Chris, because if you deduce, you're going to come up with the things that have been told to you. Mm-hmm. Rationally, logically, you're going to come to the things that have been told to you. And all that put aside, there's a heart of a matter. And that's why Captain America is the dude that when he shows up to some degree, because he's not Superman, you know, he can't come down and fix everything. But he shows up, you know, you've got a shot because this guy's going to do everything. He's going to do everything he can. And it's going to be genuine. And it's going to be the son. And he's going to say exactly what you need to hear at that moment. So you can like, you know, reflexively at all times, there's like a flag waving behind him. Like as he's talking to you with the shield and like, that's, that's that genuine, like that's that warmth shining through. That's that like, that's that bridge, in my opinion. From the emotional perspective, that's Christ. That's the prayer. That's the heart being purified. That's the good. That's heaven shining through for a moment. And like everybody recognizes it. I even on like I said, like that thing I said earlier about the relapse, people deflate. The pressure is taken off. Someone is with them now. So, you know, we we look to invert the period, the pyramid. And we look to kind of take some pressure on. You know, and by saying, hey, it's okay, I can do this. You know, the warmth, the, the warmth, the peace that you can bring to people. You can actually actually make people like kind of sleepy with how comfortable you can make them. I think, I think something you said that was just, man, so perfect, and especially with the cap thing is like, cap, cap kind of coming and saying, son, like, you know, like that, I think that's the thing is, um, a, a dad knows when he needs to step in and fix something and but more importantly he knows when it's time for you to now step mm-hmm. in and, and, and do something and I think that's what's I think that's where it gets lost for a lot of people and that's where praxis comes in you know what I mean and that's where I think someone will do really well um understanding that you know your your endeavors in your orthodoxy um are for your connection to god but like what does that mean what's that going to look like well a lot of times what that's going to look like is god's going to god's going to help you to understand that the thing that you need to do is already in front of you. It's mm-hmm. not something you need to chase after. It's not something that you need to fabricate. It's something that's already in front of you. And that's why the sobriety, the humility, um, discipline, that's why some of these things are so synonymous with orthodoxy because you need to have sobriety and humility and discipline to do the real work. Because the fanfare, the glamour, the sexiness, the valor, you know, you're gonna have maybe a handful of moments in your whole life when it's time to step up like in those, in those senses. And you're never gonna make it when it's time to step up for the valor and the glamour if you haven't been doing all the other stuff. Right. And that and that's where like, hey, Wednesdays and Fridays, man, you know, uh, you may be eating cheese, whatever, great, but like, are you saying no to the to the meat, whatever? Why does that matter? Well, it's hard to say no to, you know, porn or crack and a hooker, whatever your poison is, uh, if you can't say no to the cheeseburger on, on Friday. And people think like that's ridiculous to say, but I'm just telling you, it's true. And, and it's not the one weekend or the one week where you did really good or the one Lent you did really good. It's that day in and day out, no one's looking, right? It's the lack of the glamour. It's like, who are you when no one's looking, right? Are you doing the thing when no one's looking? Okay, if you're, I, I guarantee you, if you're doing the thing when no one's looking, you may not be Superman. You may not, you know, be a Jordan or whatever famous, you know, person, but you'll make it. 
you'll you'll make it, you know. And and I say that to you as a father, right? Like <laughs> you'll make it if you if you can if you can find it in you to be that person behind closed doors, you'll make it because that's where that's where you'll find God. And and that's where the anxiety and to be frank, the vainglory, because a lot of that comes from it's just it's vainglorious. It's what society has told people about the great destiny. And if you're not living that, you're wasting your time. And then that adds to the anxiety. And then that adds to the depression because you're wasting your life and this is all you've got. And that's why people, so many people are not authentically engaged in their spiritual life. Because it's, it's, it's all this. People are swimming in information, but no knowledge. <laughs> right? Because in order for information to become knowledge, you have to have experience. And everyone wants to bypass that. The, you know, the, the click of the keyboard allows you to do that. Like, and I mean, even to get kind of like, I don't know, a weird type of meta, but like, yeah, podcasts, whatever. But like, that's one of the big problems with it is that, you know, you can listen to something, you can read something and you think you got it. You don't. You literally have to do it. There's no other way. There's, 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 there is no other way. So the problem then becomes, well, what am I supposed to do? Do the thing that's in front of you. And, and not, not just in the sense of busy work, start seeing without looking, right? What, what, what that means is if you see, okay, does God exist? Yes. Does God love you? Yes. Okay. Like you start that, that's where dogma is so helpful. There's these dogmatic statements that we make about the father to kind of bring it bring it home that the church says this from experience well just have the faith the trust to just operate on that at least for a season of time right so therefore if god loves you and if god allows and is working everything for the betterment of your salvation okay great Inclu including or especially difficult times then what that means is it's not so much what you have to find, you have to find something to do or like what's next. You need to start seeing what's already in front of you. And the difference is looking is trying to, um, you know that phenomenon you've experienced when like you've lost something and it's just like, ah, I can't find it, I can't find it. You're tearing everything apart. Yep. Yep. You're looking at the under the dog's dish, like all this crazy stuff, right? You know it's not under the dog's dish, but like you have to try to find it. The second you sit down and go like, I don't even care anymore, you pick up your stupid phone. And it's like, oh, it's right there, right? Yeah, totally. That's that's looking. That's looking, right? But when you step back, you begin to see, right? People need to learn to see without looking. The way you do that is you just, you live your, and that's where the praxis and the liturgical life of the church is so practical in living your life, right? You do what you gotta do. But in your prayer and your faithfulness, there's a trust that becomes almost tacit. You're not, right? Like, it's, it's, it's this experience of your life, of experience. It's this process of experience your life in a tacit manner. That's what I'm talking about. I don't think about, you know, when I'm driving, I don't, I don't think about the gas and the brake like I did when I first learned to drive. It, it's tacit knowledge. Why is it tacit knowledge? Because I've experienced it so many times, right? So you have to get to the space and that's where patience comes in. You have to get to the space where you're, you're, faith your your experience of your faith your tradition becomes so tacit that you're actually doing you're 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 functioning in a way that god is able to do the work on a level where you're not even you're not looking and that's why that phenomena of like you know women who aren't getting married or men it's just like the one thing that makes them want to choke people, I was like, just stop looking so hard, just relax, right? They hate hearing that, but it's true. It's like, I know that's what happened to me. Me right? too. Right? Me too, 100%. Right? Yeah. 
right? I if mean, I was if I was looking for my wife, I would have never found her. Exactly. Never. Absolutely not. Never. 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 And so, and, and and that's why I think the you know the church life is so full. Um, if a guy is taking care of his business, meaning taking care of himself, right, tending to his body, you know, um, he doesn't have to be, you know. Schwarzenegger, whatever, but just you know, just like if you're a single dude, you know, and you're just kind of like going about your business, you're being the best you, you know, you're participating in the life of the church, you know what I mean? And you're you're just actually living your life in that sense. Those things will come, but they'll come when you begin to stop looking so intently and checking the box. Because that, because yeah. checking the box is the looking. So I don't know if that answers that, but I, but that's it's beautiful. And uh, that's the Nicene Creed. <laughs> <laughs> reviewed the whole thing. We're we're four words in. So <laughs> I mean, it sounds like the formation of the creed. So right, <laughs> yes, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. I thank you. I thank you guys for this. Uh, wow. Yeah. That, I guess. I guess. Are, are yeah, we done, we Andrew? You want to wrap it up? <laughs> yeah, I think we can call it there. So, well, thank you. That's great. Thank Anyone you. got anything really cool to say? <laughs> I don't know. I, I probably don't. Father, uh, 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 any any ending uh, any ending words? Should we? Is it appropriate to end with a prayer? Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's in, let's end with a prayer. Um, before we do that, I, I just want to say this like one thing, you know, because I mean, who knows? We're just we're here, we're talking, and I don't, we don't know. What else are we gonna do it? Yeah. But um, I, I think the thing is to understand is you know, all of the, the reason why we're even talking is because we believe that um, our experience, the three of us, our experience of 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 Christ to whatever degree of time and qualitatively entering into the church has been transformative. I mean, it's been everything. And those things that were good have been made so much better in our lives, right? So um, I think the thing is, is that this real practical kind of, that's, that's my biggest concern is that people begin to see that the theology of the church, the experience of the church, the liturgical life of the church, not only is it not just for like eggheads and people kind of nerding out on, you know, kind of arcane and abstract um, topics, but actually that kind of nerding out, if that's all you're doing, stop it. You know, uh, and, and get to a place where you're, you're starting to taste a little bit of what we talked about today. Cause I think the thing is for a lot of, I mean, beyond the fact we're just kind of riffing on whatever, I think for a lot of people, what we're talking about was in such a practical, down to earth context, they could feel like, what, what are you talking about? And if you feel like, what are you talking about? That's precisely the problem, right? You, you have to, if your understanding of God is so far removed from your day-to-day -day life that God is this very kind of exclusively exotic and um, almost like, you know, if you're almost treating like your, if your life with God is like flair, you know, on your uniform, something's wrong. Something, something's really wrong, you know? And so I just wanted to say that because you know, I mean, who knows what else will, who knows how things will go with our, you know, any further future talks, but I just think this is like a, a big thing that I, I really want everyone to understand is that um, connecting with a father who can show you, not just explain to you, but show you that life in Christ is precisely that, it's life. That's, that's the ticket. You know, from my perspective, you know, because uh, that's my experience. You know, there, there isn't anything in my life 
that Christ hasn't enriched, hasn't touched, hasn't transformed, nothing. You know, the food I eat, the stuff I do, the day to day, you know, and not because I'm a priest, by the way, long before I was a priest, that was my experience. And I think that's a real important thing to understand too. I mean, um, it's for everybody, anyways. So, well, since I think I absolutely nailed the introduction, it was not super nervous at all and didn't talk weird and fast. I think I'll try my best in the outro. So, this has been Royal uh, Royal Path Network, and I'm Andrew it's Cyprian and Father Turbo. Um, we're going to try and do this more, God willing. We'll see what happens. And um, if you guys got anything else to say, otherwise, I think we can wrap it up. Great. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, bless us, and, and, and keep us in your grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you both.